Hey everybody, welcome to Softcast. I'm Mike Lundstrom. I'm Master Gunnery Sergeant Chan Stanley. And we're here with a very special episode that I'm excited about. We have a special guest who is an immigrant to the United States, a U.S. Army Ranger, and a professional football player in the NFL. None other than Alejandro Villanueva. Yeah, Mike, we were honored to have A.V. in the studio with us. He talks about what inspired him, his call to service, how he made it into the U.S. military, the U.S. Army, 10th Mountain Division, and then gravitated to the 75th Ranger Regiment. He talks about real-world ethical dilemmas, leadership challenges under fire uh, during his time as a platoon commander in Afghanistan, and then he transitions to you know his time in the pros in the NFL, playing for the Ravens, playing for the Steelers, and then highlights you know, the events that transpired on Soldier Field during the national anthem. Uh, so it was an absolute pleasure to have him in the studio, and I can't wait to get it kicked off today. Yeah, me too. Without any further ado, let's get after it. Ladies and gentlemen, Alejandro Villanueva. Thanks for joining us today. Um, as a you know soft member myself and uh, as a huge football fan, I mean, talking to somebody like yourself who's you know, walk that path of special operations, 75th Ranger Regiment, and also former, you know, retired NFL player. You've been on both sides of that and, and um, performed at a really high elite level, right? So I just think there's a great uh, number of stories that we can tease out hopefully today that are going to resonate with our audience. So appreciate it. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, guys. So I had the unique pleasure and distinction of uh, meeting you the first time in 2019. And uh, I think it was, what, a good seven hours or so we hung out. And I learned so much through that conversation. And it really kind of, as I watched the, from the last few years, how things culminated for you, you've really performed and worked at a super high level. All right. And yeah, yeah I'm going to get there in a second. <laughs> I, think, I think high level, I mean, all this is subjective. You know, I can never say that. that well, uh, Maybe to us, mere more humble race. I've been around. I've been around amazing people. You know, I've been around incredible organizations, and I think that's the that's the the, the things that I've been really fortunate about. I've never called myself, you know, an example of the Ranger Regiment or an example of the NFL, but I've been in the 75th Ranger Regiment. And I've been to organizations like the Pittsburgh Steelers, and so I think that's that's maybe where where I get my greatness is just by being associated with those amazing organizations. Maybe it's just being humble too, right? You're, no, like really you're incredible. Yeah, I'm just, um, Let's go back to the you said a seventy fifth Ranger Regiment, right? Uh, let's go back to the beginning of that and tell us how you kind of got into the service, the call call to serve. I mean, yeah. I know there was some West Point there, and then some stuff leading up to that. So. Yeah, well, I mean, my my English is so deceiving because it's it's so it's so flawless and perfect that people don't understand that I didn't <laughs> grow up uh, in the United States. I grew up in Rhode Naval Station, which is a, a military base that's very familiar to to the soft community and especially the Marines. So. Um, Rhode Naval Station is very close to the Strait of Gibraltar, and it's been a key piece of terrain for global empires, you know, since the Phoenicians, you know, over 4,000 years ago. My hometown was founded by the Greeks. Story says that somebody escaping, you know, the, the Trojan War found in my hometown. Um, the Cadiz, which is the, the, the capital of my province, was at one point the second largest city in the Roman Empire. Three Roman emperors came from that region. Uh, you know, the, 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 the British fought Trafalgar very close to, to what saying from. warrior culture. It's military history. I mean, yeah. I, I've, I've seen life from the lens of military history. You know, I, sometimes, you know, people live in romanticized utopias and, 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 and books and whatnot. But, you know, for me, I've, I've lived life through the, the, the ruins that have been, that are left, uh, in a place like Rhoda. And it's very interesting that since 1953, the Americans are partaking in this, you know, sort of history of, 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 of the Strait of Gibraltar, of, of, of Cadiz, uh, where I'm from. And, uh, and I grew up watching Marines, you know, Marines coming in and out of Rhoda, uh, especially after 9-11, uh, you know, en route to Iraq and Afghanistan. And so um, when I was sitting in my classroom, you know, if I looked to the left, I would see F-150, CC-5, C-17s, and Marines, you know, walking to them from the, the, the necks, you know, as they like to call it, from, you know, walking with logs of dip. And then if I look to the right, I would see, you know, chickens and, and, and fruit on the, on the side, the beach, bullfighters. Uh, and so I grew up in, 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 in two cultures that were extremely fascinating. And um, I think that when you get exposed to the Marines uh, and, and you see the magic of, you know, becoming a Marine, maybe the, the commercials, the 90s commercials, oh, yeah. you know, fighting the dragon and whatnot, uh, the uniforms. 
uh, and just a sense of belonging to something that's, that's greater than yourself. You know, there's no awards on your on, on your uniform. Uh, I have I to say, I'm digging the Marine love that I'm getting right now. Yeah, I know, so but it's I, true. I appreciate that. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's true. It's true. I mean, and I, and I think, I think you know, now that I'm in the military, I mean, I support all, all brands of the military. They're all necessary. It's not like I, you know, I, I'm a horrible rivalry guy when it comes to Army, Navy, and whatnot. You know, because I grew up in a naval base. You know, and and and, and I, I can never understand. I got know. no dog in this fight. <laughs> right. No, but even even the Air Force, Army, Air Force, were the same. You know, yeah, right Force, until yeah. not too long ago. Um, but the Marines to me were sort of the inspiration to join. And I think if you did like a profile of the high schooler, you know, who wants to go into a different branch, sometimes the, maybe the craziest is the Marine. And so that's how, that's how crazy I was about serving. I wanted to belong to the unit that was without a doubt being sent into, into the, the toughest missions. It wasn't until I got to the, to the military that I saw that the Rangers were the ones that were being called uh, oh. for these missions. And so um, I wanted to, to, to join the military uh, as I was discussing earlier. I was stationed, or my, my father was stationed in, in Shea, Belgium, Supreme Headquarters, Allied Powers, Europe. And when I went to do my physical out of land stool, uh, I found out that I was call blind. So that took out the Navy and the Air Force for me. And then the Army was the, the, the last choice. And, you know, one of my best friends from high school went to West Point, um, Vice Admiral Craig Clapperton, who is the U.S. Navy Fleet Cyber Command Commander, was my football coach. Uh, when I was when I was at uh, at Shape, and you know their influence, you know was was extremely important to me uh, in terms of, you know when you when you see the the world from the lens of military history, things like honor and discipline are sort of the values that you try to embody as much as you can, and so yeah, I wanted to become an infantry officer. That's 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 who I saw myself, uh, you know, as, as as become even though I'm six ten, and it's extremely counterproductive to, to, to be so tall and, 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 and want to go into the infantry. Oh, no, I've seen the photos. You're, you're tall next to your, your, your team there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Super, super tall. Yeah, so let's, let's so you, you got that call and then you found your way into West Point. I found, uh, yeah, so. Or you were lured, I would say, would probably be better. Right, right. It, it didn't seem like an amazing deal uh, at first, you know, four years without leaving very much. But I remember when I did my, my, my visit, um, they paired me up with a, they pair me up with a cadet. I tried dipping for the first time, threw up, and as I was recovering, you know, from I this. I think we all went through that, <coughs> right? Yeah, that evolution. I went, as, as I'm recovering from this, and I'm talking to him about uh, sort of his aspirations as to what, what he wants to do, you know, what does he think about the army and whatnot. We sat down on his laptop and we started watching videos. You know, we started watching war videos, you know, and I remember seeing how emotional he was getting uh, and, and how much he just couldn't wait to graduate to join the fight. And so some people, go to the academies for different reasons. You know, they have an incredible education. They have an amazing sports program. But for me, it was this this piece of becoming a warrior that was just, you know, obviously because of where I'm from, uh, where I grew up and, and, and how I view the world that that I just couldn't wait to do. And so when I graduated, I I went to 10th Mountain Division. I got I got a tip last minute that they were going to get uh, uh, sent from Iraq to Afghanistan as part of the, that surge in 2010. Call that insider trading. Insider right? trading, 100%. Oh, yeah. It was 100% 100 insider trading. And so I was able to, to go to 10th Mount and, and start my, my, my Army career. Oh, that's incredible. So you, we, we find you in the military now and a really interesting story that I've, it, it's not just told in one place, you've told it in other venues. VMI, I think, was the last one I saw on, on the internet. Would you just um, talk about that a little bit? So you're in, are you with Tent Mountain? Are you in the Ranger Regiment by then or? No, no, this is my first deployment. So my first, first, first deployment, okay. Yeah, my first deployment, so I, I deployed for a year uh, as an infantry platoon leader at the Kandahar and Zari District. And obviously it was everything that I hoped for. It was, you know, extremely kinetic area like they used to say back then. Uh, there was a lot of insurgency that was going back and forth, crossing the Red Desert. Mula Omar was from uh, Kandahar, uh, from my the, the the village that I that, that I was you know sort of securing, um, but right away you know we we faced a lot of um, a lot of adversity. Um, the mission I'll still remember it to this day was secure the people from Zara District and everything we do. So you know our job was we saw ourselves as nation builders, you know, in a way. As a conventional army unit, you know, we were doing a lot of missions that were, you know, open up schools and securing uh, fields for the farmers and, and, and vaccinating cows. I mean, th th those were a lot of the things that we were, that we were doing in between NAI clearances and, 
and raids at night and whatnot. Security cooperation. Right, so, you know. uh, training the, the the Afghans, you know, help them get off the heroin, you know, and, <laughs> and join us on a patrol. How did that work out? Right, uh, well, I, I cannot I, I, I never want to do heroin, much less on a mission in Afghanistan, 120 degrees, but, you know, them boys, them boys did it. it. <laughs> they were able to do it. Um, and so I think once, once you get over the logistics sort of of how Afghanistan runs, you know, the, 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 the patrol cycle, uh, the equipment, you know, obviously there's a lot of uh, equipment that you have to learn how to use in Afghanistan. All your, I think it was called TPE, uh, TPE property, you know, all, our biggest threat was ID, so we had to learn how to use our balance. We had to learn how to use all of our, uh, the Thor system, you know, why not? After we get going and we can sort of think through what, what is it that we're doing, uh, it became very difficult for me as a platoon leader to constantly be in front of my men and explain them what is it that we were doing yeah. in, our, in our missions because yeah. incredible leaders challenge. I mean, I feel like I was a politician just continuously telling them that we were going to make a difference and that we were going to sort of win the war if, if we attain to these coin principles. I mean, everybody was, you know, as, as a platoon leader, you're 21 years old, you're sitting in front of 40 people and, and you have to, you have to come up with something, you know, you have to say something, you have to, you know, sort of follow the script. I, I, don't, I don't know how else to explain it. And um, in the midst of the fighting season, uh, we found ourselves sustaining casualties you know, for three, four weeks, out of, you know, continuously into a, a low point where, well, we we're doing a mission with these, you know, Afghan national police that were not in their best state of mind uh, and securing a, a house for uh, a search that we were doing. Uh, there was a, a huge escape from prison, the Sarposa uh, prison escape you know, where 500 Taliban escaped and went back into the villages. So we were going after one of these guys. And as we were securing the compound, one of the Afghan National Police uh, members shot down a civilian as he was coming through a river wadi. And, you know, while we consolidated everybody into the house and we were assessing the situation, we, you know, we were told that, that we had to conduct a BDA on the, on, the, on, on, the, on the site, which is roughly, you know, say like 100 meters away from, from the compound that we were at. And... It was not in an ideal location because it was surrounded by trees and it was in a dry riverbed. So if you're familiar with Afghanistan, you know, dry riverbeds are very depressed. And if you have trees on the side, it just, it just screams. You know, it looks like that. It looks like that. Textbook that's, ambush, right? When you're looking yeah. through, you know, field operation right. manual. This right. is what an ambush zone looks this like. Is what like an the kill zone, right? Right, right. I mean, it looks like. If you, textbook. If I were to describe it to people, it looks like the place where uh, Mufasa died. Uh, in the Lion King, you know, that's, that's kind of basically what it looked like, except you had trees on the side. And as we were getting ready to sort of come up with a plan of action, there was a lot of, he you know, m it, people in my platoon were, were extremely hesitant as to the why is it that we were going to do it at that point. And there was a lot of reluctancy to, 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 to do the mission to the point where, you know, they, they, they just didn't want to do it. And, and, and they offer courses of action that were you know, obviously unethical, you know, not following a direct order uh, is, is something that, that has its repercussions. And, you know, I, I use that example because I think that in life, uh, especially in the military, as you have to decipher sort of these, these situations, you're going to be put between the mission and your men, you know. It, yeah, and, and, and you're going to have, sometimes you're going to have two bad options, you know, that a bad tactical option on the mission side and a bad uh, sort of, uh, decision that could affect the loyalty and the and the relationship that you have with your man. And so I live with my men in a small cop, you know, on the side of the road. I, I care deeply about them. Um, they talked about their children all the time. And, and the war in Afghanistan was very complicated because we were not seeing any results. And it's not like we were seeing any buy-in from the people either. So you, you find yourself in a situation where you don't believe in, you know, anything coming out of this mission, but you're told to do it. Um, it's hard to show tangible progress. And if I could just add, I, I don't want to derail your story, but <clears throat> one of the challenges that we see nowadays is your, uh, say, E5, E6 soft member that's coming to the teams. Uh, the culture is different, right? They're, they're, not, uh, they're much more highly educated, right? right they're very right. smart. Um, they're technically proficient. And they're not going to just uh, eat up uh, something that, you know, they're being fed just right. because, hey, the boss said it. They're going to challenge you and question you. 
And the most important question they ask, and they ask it frequently, is why? Exactly. So as a leader, you have to have good answers, right? right. Because if you try to pull the wool over their eyes, uh, they're going to see through that, right? And then you just through. lose trust and, and confidence, the whole mission command piece. And then you, you don't have... Uh, you don't really have control of the situation anymore. So I just wanted to throw that out there no, that, no. you know, from when I first came in to where it does what it's told, right? Right. Um, and now right. it's like, well, why? That doesn't make sense. Right. And, and you're absolutely right. It's, it's those, you know, the smart soldiers are the ones that are obviously, you know, the, the most capable of, 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 in terms of potential. Yeah, those, I mean, we, we attract that type right. of individual to soft, right? That's what we want, physically capable, sure, but also you know, mental acuity. There's a big why behind why we serve. For sure, for sure. But, but it, I think that the, the circumstances, meaning you know, you're there for seven months already, you, know, you still got f- six months left, you, you're losing guys left and right, you know, you're just getting hurt nonstop. It's so frustrating to deal with Afghans that are just continuously lying to your face all the time. The Afghan National Police is the one that shot this man. and. We have to do BDA because it's part of the, you know, CCIR commander's critical information requirement. So somebody sipping on a, you know, on a, on a coffee mug, you know, miles and miles away is seeing this on a screen and saying, hey, they're only 100 yards away. Just go to BDA so we can see if there's any casualties and we have to deal with the repercussions of having killed or hurt uh, a civilian casu- uh, you know, member. And it's those smart soldiers that are saying, you know, why are we doing this? You know, why are we doing BDA for something that we didn't do? Why are we putting ourselves at risk for something like this? And when you're at, trying to answer these questions, you cannot come up with good answers because you know that when they come out of your mouth, they're just terrible. You know, you're, and not, the, a, you're not a good liar, which is a leadership quality, right? Right, right. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, and, and, and you cannot say, I don't know, we're just being told to do this, you know, because they, they, they deserve a better answer than that. And so um, I try to obviously ask for more assets. I try to talk to my company commanders, see if there's another course of action that we can do. But ultimately, it was just a very straightforward, hey, go do conduct BDA. And, you know, I usually use that example just to make cadets or make students think as to, you know, obviously, it's a very difficult situation. You know, you're going to pull your rank, which is the worst nightmare for a lieutenant, you know, to have to say, I am an officer. Do what I. That's. That, I mean, you, you never want to even have that. Very transactional. You've already lost control at that point. Right. right. You've yeah. lost control at that point. You've lost trust. You know, there's no way that you can go back for six months and, and sleep. I mean, you know, we all sort of grow up romanticizing Vietnam, and we know what happens in Vietnam. Those are the first stories about being a platoon leader. It's just you know, the 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 the, the, yeah. the, the incidents that, that that happened when the platoon leaders were endangering uh, sort of your men. So. Um, always pose that question to see what, you know, people would do. And then, you know, in my case, I was very fortunate. Obviously I used a story where, you know, I thought I came up with uh, a way of resolving this issue without either compromising my men or the mission in, in the sense that I just said, man, I'm going to go down by myself. If anybody wants to join me, you know, you're more, you know, you, you can come and, and, and help me on this. Obviously I took the Afghans down with me. Uh, they had no choice. And they probably didn't know what was going on either. <laughs> they were so out of their minds. And, you know, ultimately we, you know, we started walking down the river, uh, river Wadi, got an ambush, got into a firefight, black on ammo. We never got to check, you know, whether the, the, the man was dead or alive. And, you know, we came back and, 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 and now you have to sit and sort of process through what just happened, you know. And, and everybody understands, you know, the situation that I was put in. You know, people are very rational. You know, we're all the same. You know, if we were to change our ranks, we would have acted in the same, you know, sort of, um, you know, matter, which is, you know, you don't want to, you don't ever want to challenge your integrity because then you have no credibility either way. You know, if you, if you don't listen to your company commander, you're not, you're going to lose your credibility regardless of, of, of what is it that you do. And if you pull your rank on your men and, and you do something without giving the, the proper explanation, then you're also going to lose credibility. So that contrast between the mission and the men is the reason why I, I use that example. And I think it also exemplifies a little bit of the challenge that we face in Afghanistan. You know, I think nobody, nobody wants to think about Afghanistan anymore. I think even talking about Afghanistan right now is somewhat of, of a difficult, you know, process because, you know, it's, what do we make of Afghanistan? You know, how do, how do we reconcile the, the 20 years that we spent there? But uh, it does give you some insight into some of the challenges that we faced and, and, and how we reacted and, uh, maybe, you know, these circumstances can help us become better as we prepare for the next next conference. It's certainly a great leadership example, right? Damn. I think it's a dilemma. At the same time, you followed orders and you found a way to do it that got your men behind you. And I think that's very powerful for, for people to understand. 
Yeah. Obviously, That's why I like going to that store. Yeah. There, then you know, obviously there's a lot more context to it, but there's a lot of, you know, my, the, the unit that I served with was incredible. I, I can never compare myself to any of the, the soldiers that I, that I served with because they were so incredibly brave and, and I was able to witness them battle through horrible explanations as to what is it that we're doing and they were still able to, to go out there and do the job. And so they always say that, you know, the, the NCOs are the backbone of the army. And so for me, it was one of those humbling experiences of seeing uh, how they can not, not only overcome mistakes of, of, of the higher chain of command, but how they could also continue to, you know, behave as uh, as incredible warriors that are always willing to take the enemy to the fight. So, yeah. fight to the enemy. One of the the basic you know tenets of leadership that I've learned over the years, you know, when I was coming up, is just the the simple never never send someone to do or test someone to do something that you're not willing to do yourself, right? right? Whether whether that's taking out the trash or whether that's investigating a, a, a river bed that is probably ambushed or, or booby trapped, right? Right, right. So um, so sort of leading from the front, leading by example. Uh, and that's how you, you know, just got your men behind you. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that's a, that's an amazing point. I think in the 2010 sort of time frame, that lesson was so beat down on every infantry lieutenant that I don't think, you know, that was ever an issue that a lieutenant would ever be afraid of clearing a house or being the number one man. I think that the number one thing is, you know, never be afraid of, of, of anything. You have to be a warrior and that's the number one thing. You know, I don't think... I don't think people will sign up to do the infantry when there were two wars going on at the same time that would ever say, I'm not willing to, to, to go down a river wadi or do something that I would ask my men. And also, you know, we were fighting in such a different sort of war where, you know, I had to leave two squads in my combat outpost so they could man the base and then I had to go out with two squads. So there's only, you know, based on block leave and whatnot or R&R, or, or I'm only going out with 12, 12 people, you know, so I'm almost somewhat operating like a, like an SF team, you yeah, know, as a regular it's army not unit. not a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so I mean, sometimes my, you know, my RTO, my FL guy, my medic, we have to be a, a, a team, you know, and we have to maneuver because this is not that many people, so. Yeah, yeah interesting. So, so take us from, from that, there's a period of time, um, and then all of a sudden we find yourself uh, in the Ranger Regiment? Uh, yeah, so I, um, I, I got a chance to do a mission with the Rangers when I was uh, a platoon leader as the BSO, the Battle Space Owner. And I got a chance to see how they operated. Uh, I think at West Point and in the Army in general, the Rangers have an incredible uh, reputation for being um, extremely unique in their discipline, their approach, being quiet professionals. Um, I've always been intrigued and, and amazed by military culture, and the Ranger culture was the the one that that, that really stuck with me. You know, just yeah, it's amazing. you know, you meet. You know, an NCO who's got 19 deployments and the way he conducts himself, the way when you listen to him talk, when you listen to his lifestyle, you know, how quiet, how quietly he lives, you know, in Fort Benning on a base and all he likes to do is hunt and, you know, cut the grass on the weekends. But in the meantime, he's got 19 deployments and he's just, you know, an incredible just warrior. They, they, they run, they do this five mile test, clean shaving. There's, there's, there's a very different standard, I think. Uh, within the Ranger Regiment, and, and, and especially especially for officers. You know, they really hammer down on officers. You know, they want to make sure that, that they're worthy enough of, of, of leading a platoon of, 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 you know, 40 Rangers. And so I became, you know, very intrigued, you know, and, and, and obviously I had incredible mentors, and, you know, Todd Brown, who's currently the J3 of, of a JSOC, was somebody who was, uh, you know, always put on the, the, the Ranger board in my ear. And I think um, I was an Army football player as well, uh, and Army football is an interesting subculture within West Point. And so for me, you know, I was, I was, I mean, I, again, Army football captain, I don't know what it means. I, I never, you know, I, one of those titles that, that, that doesn't mean much, but um, for me, it was important to make sure that, you know, Army football can be connected again to the Ranger Regiment and then it can be uh, somewhat of a feeder for, for future officers. And so I knew that if, if, if I went to Ranger Regiment that, you know, perhaps somebody from the football team will be inspired then to, to serve. And, and, and I do think that Army football has such an you know, incredible, unique set of qualities that, that would be very beneficial uh, for the overall Army. And so um, I love the Rangers. I love the fact that they, you know, sort of go back and forth, you know, with the Army. And so you, you get to experience, you know, the regular Army, which is an incredible, uh, fascinating, challenging, and, 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 and motivating uh, aspect of the military. And then, you know, get to get to 
touch the dragon a little bit and see the magic, you know, with, with, with night vision goggles and lasers on your guns. Yeah, one of the culture uh, aspects of, of being in soft that I've always admired, we like to say uh, selection is continuous, right? It never ends. So, so if you go through an assessment selection process and, and you actually get selected and you make it, uh, you haven't actually arrived, right? You get there and then you're faced with another set of challenges. Right. And then you have to prove yourself again and then you have to you know, go on a pre-deployment training and you have to prove yourself again and then you have to deploy and prove yes. yourself again. And, and the moment when you think, okay, I finally got it figured out and I know my job and I'm good at what I do, then somebody says, oh, hey, you're gonna move over here and you're gonna get promoted or you're gonna get moved into another billet that's more responsibility and you're back at square one trying to prove yourself again. Right. And there's not a lot of leeway to mess up, right? Because there's a line of people right behind you that are chomping at the bit that would gladly take your position, right? right? So that, that's one thing that makes you strive to just continue to push and be better than you were tomorrow than you were today. For sure, for sure. And, and it's funny that you mentioned that because you know in the NFL, for example, sometimes you celebrate when you sign a contract you know, to become a member of a team or you make the 53-man roster but then you realize next year you got to do it all over again. <laughs> and there's 90 guys that are coming in to take your job. I made it last year. Like I that made it last count. year. It means uh, nothing. Yeah, the only thing that matters in the NFL is performance. Right. And, but same thing with the Ranger Regiment. You know, you make it and you hear this. Then you start hearing the stories about the Black Chinook coming in and start taking lieutenants away. And, you know, the, the fact that your, your life and your dreams as a lieutenant could be over in, in just one mistake. You know, so that's why you have to always be careful and have a little bit of a anxiety, you know, to, to, to your to your demeanor and then knowing just how important pressures everything is because by the time the Black Chinook comes over, it's too late, you know? Right. That Chinook is coming with somebody with him, you know? It's not, it's not going to leave empty. It's not going to like, okay, this last chance, you know? You're like, no, no, no. As soon as it comes, you know, you're done. That's a healthy amount of fear, right? That's right. good for the organization. Of course. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's pretty amazing. So you, that's pretty distinguished army. Uh, piece of your life there, but somewhere in the, along the line, you had an opportunity to transition in back to football. Mm, I, yeah, I don't think I don't think uh, transitioning back to football is the right word because I don't think anybody uh, you know spends five. You had years, an opportunity then to try out. I had an opportunity, but it was but it was an it was an opportunity that was motivated by the fact that I was leaving the military. So the circumstances around him, you know, my my departure from the military were you know obviously the BRAC movement, one brigade less for every division. So there's an excess of officers. I went light on my first assignment, so I had to go heavy on my next assignment. I was not looking forward to being a heavy, you know, mechanized infantry soldier. I don't fit in vehicles, you know? And so for me, it was a very tough decision to, you know, either make a phone call and, and, and call an officer to help bail me out of this, you know, or uh, leave the military. So for me, it was, again, one of those dilemmas. Like if I make a phone call now, you know, that phone call's gonna, maybe somebody's not gonna be able to bail me out in the future of my career, if I, I'm lucky enough to ascend in rank, and then I'm basically in, in the world of politics, you know, in the world of, you know, if, if he likes you, he'll promote you, if not. And so, you know, I've seen that world through my dad and whatnot, and, 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 and so, you know, I was bitter that, 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 I, had, that I had to face this, this dilemma, you know, I wanted to serve, I want to be a platoon leader in combat all the time, don't send me back home, you know, that's, that's what I want to do, it's my destiny, I'm, I'm, I'm Lieutenant Dan with legs, you know, like, <laughs> don't send me back, and, and then I'm back in the United States and I have to, you know, that's the thing about service, you're serving the military, you know, the military is not serving you, there's not somebody HRCs, you know, like an agent saying, hey, how do we keep, you know, Lieutenant Villanueva happy, you know, I was like, no, no, Lieutenant Villanueva's got to go to Fort Hood, and he's going to do inventories for a year, and then he's going to do flipples, and then he's going to change out of command, and then he's going to move on with his career, because that's what we want him to do, and so maybe the age, maybe my ego, um, just, you know, I said, you know what, I'm going to show the army that I can do something better, you know, and I'm going to go to business school, and they were like, well, how are you going to pay for it? It's like, well, you know, I'm gonna go to the NFL. <laughs> I'm gonna go to the NFL. I'm gonna try out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just play one year, and then uh, I'm gonna make it. And they're like, "You're crazy! I haven't played. I was not even good in college. You know, there's no way I deserve, or there's no way that in, in, a, in an actual plan. I mean, sometimes I would listen to my soldiers tell me their plan as they're gonna get out of the army, and they'll talk about like these landscaping businesses, and they were gonna like, you know, be the the, the owner of Chicago. You know, this is this is interesting because I saw a clip of you in college. Uh, as a tight end, I believe. Wide receiver. Yeah, wide receiver, catching yeah. in, uh, passing in the end zone. So just for people who are audio only listening to this and him not wanting to fit into a mechanized infantry division type vehicle, he's six foot nine, 270 pounds. Two hundred seventy pounds. Yeah. 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 So that's, yeah, it's, this all makes sense now. But, right. Yeah. Keep yeah, going. Yeah, I know. I mean, it, 
everywhere I went in the army. I mean, actually, if you look at the charts of you know, height and weight, you know, they stop at 80 inches. I'm 82 inches. So you cannot extrapolate the, you know, the, the amount of, like, I think I'm supposed to be 240 pounds, you know, so there's no way that you can make that jump to 280 pounds or 270. And then it truly it's a nightmare for me to be in a vehicle. I mean, it's a nightmare for me to be driving, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it, it wasn't, it wasn't something that I could see myself doing, regardless of how much the army, you know, needed me to serve in Fort Hood or, you know, whatever other mechanized unit. Um, so you, you thought you would try out. So I thought I would try out. Uh, I know that the the NFL has an incredible admiration for the military. It goes hand in hand. You know, some people have told me that the origins of football stem from you know men at Harvard and Yale trying to like increase their manhood by battling each other <laughs> with strategy and you know, honor and camaraderie and whatnot. And and that's how football started. You know, there was there was no war period in between those. And so it is very obvious when you join a football team and you start seeing the drills that it looks a lot like basic training. I mean, first of all, they're screaming and yelling at you the whole time. You know, me being from Europe, I'm like, well, you know, why is this a, this is a game? You know what I mean? But there's just- it's supposed to be fun, right? It's supposed to be fun, but they're just pitting against each other. You know, they're, they're trying to develop that inner anger. They're trying to develop things in you that are mean because you have to be mean. Yeah. And those Con are the same controlled things. aggression, right? You know, turn it on and off. Yeah, even for someone like me, it was no- it Coming from a, a Marine, right? Yeah. Right. I mean, I'm, my, 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 coach, my coach would tell players on the team, go, go, pick a fight with him today. Go punch him in the face in the middle of practice. Because I was always so lackadaisical and I was just, you know, oh, I, I was so amazed by America. I was so amazed by being in this country and experiencing these things. You know, I was so amazed by, you know, going to Georgia with my buddies on spring break and eating Chick-fil-A and then going to Panama City and like experiencing all these things that football was something that, that, that didn't matter much to me. So in order to stimulate that, you know, you need to develop that aggression. And that aggression is also developed in the military through these training exercises where they're yelling at you and they're constantly stressing you out so that you stand up to the guy that's yelling at you so that you prove him wrong. I mean, that's, I, I, I feel like, and I think that that's the intended result. You start yelling at somebody, hey, you this and that and that, and you want him to, 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 to conquer, you know, that pressure through his inner fortitude. And so, um, you know, when I was playing football, uh, you know, I, I didn't really quite understand this, this concept. And so they always put me in different positions. You know, I played wide receiver one year. I played tight end. I mean, not tight end. I played defensive end. I played offensive lineman. Um, and so, you know, my football experience was really, really interesting. But when I knew that there was a connection between the military and football, then I thought that maybe there was a coach out there who loves the military so much for this very same principle that is willing to sign me keep me for a year to see if I'm worthy, to, to, to become the hero that transforms the soldier into the player, you know what I mean? And I can use that money to pay for business school yeah. and not get myself in debt $150,000 and start a family, you know, in the hole. So that was my, my thought process. It was extremely naive. It was extremely childish and, 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 and full of ego and full of, uh, you know, this resentment that I had towards the military because I couldn't be a platoon leader in combat no more. And so it's funny that it worked out, but you know, at the end of the day, you know, obviously now looking back, you know, there's, you know, I'm, I'm full of jealousy right now when I see a Marine uniform, you know, right in front of me in a perfect haircut. I'm <laughs> sorry, I'm I can, sorry I brought him. If I can pull that thread just for a second. So you have a little bit of anger and some resentment uh, towards the army writ large, right? And, and you're moving towards your, your um, potentially poised to seize an opportunity to play at the NFL. We don't know if that's gonna materialize yet, right? But you had a lot of personal relationships, even though you were the commander, right? Uh, the platoon level. Um, and then later on, right, I, know, I read your bio um, a little bit higher. What you're the, uh, the company level as well, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, personal relationships with some, um, I'm sure, great, great men, right? Right. great people. Um, did you also feel a sense of, you know, maybe obligation or, or, or loss just of, that you know you're leaving those guys behind to pursue something else. Oh, for sure. But but the, the issue is that I was not going to stay in Ranger Regiment for more than four months. So no matter what, you were. So had no matter to, what, you I had to move leaving. on anyway. I had to move on no matter what. I was I was pissed that I was going to miss four months of Ranger Regiment. You know, I mean, that's, I, I was literally considering not going to these tryouts because four months. You know, four months. It's they got blown out to go to Syria. You know, I missed a Syria sort of mission. I mean, those things are just they just they just they 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 irk they 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 they, yeah. they eat you up inside. When I was in the NFL. And my platoon was deployed and they were, you know, going on a mission. So I was like, man, I cannot believe I'm not there. You know, that's been, and that will be forever. My biggest regret is the fact that I've not been able to seize uh, a lot of the opportunities that I could have done with my timeline. And a lot of them, in my opinion, 
were handicapped by the fact that I decided to become an officer. And I think I would have been a much better fit if I would have become enlisted and have a lot more control over my career and be able to stay in one place. You know, I could have been a 175 for, you know, from 2006 all the way until the war was over in 2014. That would have been amazing. I would have gone 10 years almost, you know, uh, without having to move back and forth and spend four years at West Point. So obviously I, 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 I loved every single person that I served with and my brothers until this day. I, you know, all my best friends are all from the military. Um, but, you know, they were also moving on as well. They were also getting out and they were also facing these same dilemmas of, you know, I got to do what, something. What next, I'm, right? What next, right, right, right. So what next was you got a shot with the Philadelphia Eagles? Chip Kelly loved the military. Yeah, he did. <laughs> so that's yeah. the reason why I got the chance. I mean, I, I think that's the reason why I got the shot. Yeah. How uh, did that work? How did that? Uh... Yeah. So it was it was actually pretty sad because uh, I went and did the tryout. I, you know, I, I brought in my tight end gloves. I thought I was going to do a, 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 a tryout at tight end. And then they made me do an offensive line workout. And they said I was too skinny. And they didn't have the... I'm gonna get. I'm gonna come back to that in a, in a little bit. Yeah, they way. didn't think that it's not feasible to sign a player that weighs 260, 265 to play offensive lineman. So you know, they did the workout. They knew I played offensive lineman in college, and I had an amazing coach uh, in Stan Brock who played in the NFL for 14 years. And then they, um, then they worked me out at defensive end and they say, okay, that, that, that's, that, that could be your position. We're gonna, we're gonna sign you to. And then it was the same thing that we, we mentioned earlier. I remember being in Philadelphia. I remember the camera signing the contract. But then I remember looking at the guys that were playing defensive line for the Philadelphia Eagles. And it was, you know, Brandon Graham, Fletcher Cox, uh, Vinnie Curry. You know, there was no way mathematically that I was ever going to be able to unseat any of those players without having played football in college at a decent level. I mean, I never took, I mean, I think I played like three snaps against VMI my freshman year as a defensive end before they moved into offensive tackle. So I never played defensive you know, end in my entire life. And so I couldn't, I couldn't really expect to make the team. So I was signing a contract that was going to be an amazing story on the news. Oh, look at this player that's trying out. But in the back of my mind, I was like, there's no way. I'm, it's not going to work out. There's zero chance that I'm going to play. There's no way that they're going to say, hey, Fletcher, you know, great job getting 13 sacks last year. But we got this Army Ranger here who's going to really show us how to win football games. So I knew that it, it was going to be a... OTAs into training camp, battle it out, show some guts, and then they're going to cut me. And so I was anticipating being cut, you know, the whole time. Um, so that was my time in Philly. That, that's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, when you arrive, say, at a soft team and you're looking around and you've just, you know, maybe been selected and you've gone through some challenges. So you, you're instantly greeted from, you go from, hey, I, I made it, I belong here. And then you're looking around at all these talented right super, uh, you know, proficient, competent people that have potentially all this experience, combat, everything else. And then you're thinking, I don't know if I belong here. Yeah, yeah right. For sure. I'm in the company of greatness, right? And, and maybe I got, uh, you know, sidetracked along the way, right? Somehow I, I should have taken a left turn at Albuquerque, right? And, right, and right, I ended right. up here. Um, but that's where it comes back to, okay, how can I turn this around and learn from these people so I can, maybe I can tap into a little yeah. bit of that greatness. Yeah. And, and I did, but I mean, at first I thought that the plan backfired. The plan is that, okay, so maybe because of my unique story and circumstance, they'll sign me. But the problem is that they're going to sign you and you're going to be with incredible, you know, so, so there's no way because they're signing you for this reason that you're going to be able to accomplish the goal of making one year's worth of salary to pay for business school. Business school was my goal. I wanted to go to business school because when you grow up in, in an environment like West Point, you're constantly looking at your teammates, I mean, your classmates, and you're constantly gauging what is it that they're doing. Oh, he's going 82nd. Okay, I got to go to 82nd too. Oh, he's branching infantry. Oh, me too. And then afterwards is, oh, he's going to Harvard Business School. Oh, I want to go to you know Chicago Booth. I want to go to Stanford. There's, there's, there's so much competition between your classmates, and that's what allows the, 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 the academy to become sort of – you know, what it is now. It's just that the people are just always constantly competing with each other. You have a class rank attached to you all four years that you're there. The problem is that when I got to Philly and I knew that I was not going to make it, you know, I knew that I had to give it my best shot. And so my best shot might have been just getting a sack during preseason. Maybe it's just playing well enough so that another team picks me up. And so you're absolutely right. I started learning and getting that humility from guys like Fletcher Cox, Guys like, you know, Brandon Graham, Vinnie Curry, just amazing football players, uh, Connor Barwin. So I started just being all the way at the bottom, 
a private basically and just saying, teach me how to shoot this rifle. And so I started asking these questions about how to do pass rush moves and, and how to play a game and how to analyze and study tackles. And then from there, from this study of offensive linemen, then when I made my transition into tackles, then it helped me sort of understand how defensive players think of offensive players, you know? And so it was a, uh, it was definitely a, a moment of, oh man, I don't belong here, but you're absolutely right. You know, if, if you don't belong somewhere, then okay, what is it that you need to do to belong? You know, is it the credibility of having played in games or is it the work ethic? You know, like what's the first step? And the first step is to get on the field. You have to get on the field to get that credibility, you know? So you have to be in a good position on a deployment to be able to prove your skills on an actual environment. So that's the first skill. You know what I mean? Don't, don't mess up the opportunity when you get out there, know what you're going to do in a training exercise so they can give you the full faith into deploying with your unit. Yeah, hard work and perseverance pays off because somebody saw you. Yeah, 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 for sure. That was, uh, yeah, Coach Tomlin. Yeah, yeah. you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, uh, so in my third preseason game, we played uh, we played against the Pittsburgh Steelers, and uh, I was still on active duty, so I had to salute the national anthem uh, every single time. You know, I, I've never heard the national anthem and not salute it. And I think uh, Coach Tomlin saw me across uh, the field, and Coach Tomlin is potentially, you know, the only genius that I've ever met in my entire life. Oh, he's an amazing coach. Yeah, I'm not just an amazing coach. He's a very intelligent human being in the way that he's able to read people. You know, I think he took a lot of pride in his early years and his ability to recruit. And I think being from Virginia also gives him an incredible perspective of the diversity of uh, different jobs and different occupations and different people and different family structures and how they all affect into your perception of the world. And so I think he was able to get to know every single scenario that you could have uh, you know, related to, 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 to football candidates. And, and he was able to exploit that, you know, to sell you and to his school and how he was going to, you know, help you become an incredible player. And I think that, you know, when you're so obsessed with getting to know the little regions of, oh, you know, what's it like to recruit in Atlanta versus Cincinnati? And then you have somebody who's from Europe, you know, in the military and he's 6'10 and he's saluting and he played receiver in college. I mean, it's just, I think it was maybe too many questions and, it intrigued him enough uh, to give me a call and give me a chance to do a workout uh, with with the Pittsburgh Steelers. And once I got there, they had a Hall of Fame coach, Mike Munchak, who's you know <laughs> potentially the greatest the greatest human being in, in the National Football League. And uh, for for his type of play, he wanted selfless players. He wanted players that were ready to make the tough call uh, whenever it presented itself, so that the help would be allocated to those players that needed it the most. Uh, talent did not mean so much to him. And so for me, it was a, a, a perfect fit because I had no talent, you know, whatsoever. And, and I was ready to, to sort of learn. And I, I would disagree. No, yeah, I'm 6'10". Yeah, sometimes, sometimes when, I, when I always try to tell you, I was like, yeah, dude, you're 6'10 still. You know, it's true. Right? I mean, I, I do have uh, physical, you know, qualities that are, that, are, that are somewhat unique. But I think it was his approach to the game what really helped me understand not just the game of football, but how to play offensive line. And then under Coach Tomlin, I was able to, you know, sort of dream again about achieving great things. I think I lost a little bit of that in the army, you know, after, you know, seeing that romanticized dream about being a soldier and fighting into a war that then doesn't give you all the fulfillment that you think that, that you're gonna get out of it because, you know, the war doesn't have a clear victory or, or, or a winning scenario. Uh, but when Coach Tomlin was able to sort of put in front of you, you know, what is it that you can do with your career to help your family? I mean, every single time you say your mom, you know what I mean? Like he loves using the mom as an example. Like every single time you can, you, can, you can do something to help your mom, then uh, you stimulate a lot of drive in you. And so it was an incredible environment, amazing organization. And I was very fortunate to be there, you know, for as long as I did. So oh, I want to go back a little bit because I said I'd come back to this. You're about 260 or so in weight. And pounds. Yeah. So I remember hanging out with you in 2019. You talked about this and that was... You have your normal body frame, and then you have your NFL body frame, mm -hmm. and what you need to do to get prepared for that, and what you had to go through to do that. Because I think a lot of it says how you take care of yourself in the long run. It's very relatable to our audience as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. So when I when I when I made the transition to play offensive line, uh, when when you look around and you see you know what what the uh, typical offensive lineman looks like, you know if you show up to Ranger Regiment, you know I was like okay, well I gotta get sleeve tattoos now and I gotta get my hair perfectly, you know, comb over, and then that's kind of what a Ranger looks like. Uh, when you get to the NFL, everybody's 320 pounds. That was like the the weight. If you didn't weigh 320 pounds, I felt that defenders would think that they can just run you over. You know, if you weigh 305 pounds, if you're a player that struggles to hold weight 
that means that you don't think in the back of your mind that you're big enough to hold the bull rush. And the bull rush is the number one pass rush move, which is basically the offensive, the defensive tackle, you know, lowering his head into your chin and just bullying you into the quarterback. So if you want to play offensive tackle in the NFL, you have to be able to stop that first. You know, the bull rush is the one thing that you always, at any given time, you have to be able to stop. And so for me, you know, I, I was 265 pounds. I feel that that insecurity of being so light uh, would not go away unless I weighed those 320 pounds. And then, you know, I started working at it. Obviously, when you stop running five miles every other day, you know, and you start eating as it's much. It's a little bit easier to put weight it's on. Lot, it's, yeah. a, it's a lot easier, yeah. So I just ballooned up, you know, and, and I started gaining a lot of weight, not necessarily muscle, but weight. And then when, you know, you're basically working out, you know, especially in the spring off season, you're working out like three, four hours a day and then you're just sleeping the rest of the day and you're just like a sumo wrestler. You're just being treated, just waking up, eating, go back to sleep, waking up, eating, you know, lifting. Uh, that becomes your job. And so my professional success was tied up to this idea that I had of becoming a player that, that would fit in, you know. I would wear elbow sleeves, even though I had no issues, you know, just so I could fit in. I would grow a beard, so I would look more intimidating. Yeah, I remember those photos. Right, right, right. Even though you know, I, you know, I, 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 gladiator I, looking, right, AV, right, right, right. But I would do, I would, yeah. just, I would do all those things just so I could fit in. And so then, when I'm 330 pounds, and I got a beard, and I got elbow sleeves, and I got gloves, and I'm looking at myself in the mirror, I say, "That's a, that's an NFL football player." So when I line up against a defensive end, he's looking at me and saying, "That's an NFL tackle." And so from there, mentally, I can start going. But if I line up at 265 and I'm not wearing gloves, and I got a clean shaving, and he looks at me, he says, dude, this guy's a tight end, I'm gonna run him over, you know? So a lot of it is about perception, the perception that you have with yourself, and for me to succeed professionally, that weight was a huge uh, variable that I had to conquer, and it became my only priority in the offseason. My only priority in the offseason was become strong and big, you know, so that's, that's, that's all I cared about. If I can, I just wanna just tie this back into culture, and just to show how important it is, if you're showing up to that soft team for the first time, or maybe you're just checking into a new unit, and you're looking around for examples of people that are there, that are they're well qualified, that have positioned themselves in leadership, billets, right? And they're clearly successful. And you're looking around to determine what right looks like. Right, right, right. So that I can model myself after sure. these individuals and hopefully have some success of my own. How important is it to have that culture for those new people coming in to show them the right way first and foremost and so that they don't pick up too many bad habits. For sure, for sure. It's, it's, it's who you want to emulate, you know, who are your 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 heroes in the and so for me it was David DeCastro. You know, David DeCastro played with two elbow sleeves, he had a beard and he was three hundred and twenty yeah. pounds. So I wanted to become just like him. But but you're absolutely right. When you 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 gotta you gotta ask yourself who are you trying to emulate. Sure, you know? and it starts maybe with like, hey, I want to look how they look. Oh, he's kind of he's he's well uh, built or fit. Okay, I'm gonna start up my game in the gym. Right. But I think it translates later on too to like, hey, I like the way they carry themselves. I like yes. the way they communicate. Right. Right. They're well respected here. I, right. yeah, I want to learn some of those skills. Yeah. I want to be a good leader as well, right? Everybody looks up to them. How can I become that person, right? Right. So at, at first, maybe it's just a material or a sort of visual, like, hey, how can I sort of get the cool gear and fit in that way? But but the more important stuff is the intangibles. For sure, ideology. I mean, you, you, a clear example is teenagers. You know, when teenagers are going through their faces and they start hanging out with different people, they change the way they look, they change the way their hair you know, looks. They're very impressionable at that point. Very impressionable. And then they change the way they think. And so for me, it was the same way. I started changing the way I, th I thought. I said, I'm not going to... You know, I'm, I'm going to give up drinking, for example, because, the, you know, the caster doesn't drink. You know, I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to. The only, my only priority is to be successful at football because that was his priority. It's just become solely focused on being successful. That's it. You know, don't have any other priorities in life. Don't get mixed up with any other things. And so you're absolutely right. I started trying to look like him, even though I had a different personality. But over time, I became more like him. And then we started driving together to work, and now we're virtually the same person, you know? If I would have brought him into the podcast, you would have not known that, that, you know, whether it's me or him, because we look that much alike. We both lost the weight. We both have the same ideology regarding to, you know, philosophy, politics, and not. Just from picking up, you know, me picking up on him as a role model that I wanted to follow into the NFL. Adopting what's successful. Right. Uh, that's freaking fantastic. So at some point, it wasn't about business school anymore because you got selected to a Pro Bowl, and, and you got a contract for a long tenure with the Steelers. Right. Talk a little bit about that. 
Yeah, no, but you know, it's funny is that uh, out of the two things that I did in Pittsburgh, you know, I was playing football, but I was also getting my, I was getting my master's. So I would go from six to 5 p.m. I was with the Steelers and then at 6 p.m. I would drive a few miles over to the, you know, shady side and I would go to Carnegie Mellon for night classes all the way until 10 o'clock. Um, while I was doing my MBA, I think, you know, I, I talked about David DeCastro, who's a Stanford player, extremely intelligent, um, very interesting story as well. Parents coming from South Africa, living in Seattle, a part of the world that I did not know, you know, in my experience here uh, in the United States. But Carnegie Mellon was the most influential place my seven years that I was in Pittsburgh. Carnegie Mellon was the goal. My goal was not, I mean, it's, it's easy to say, you know, obviously you sign a multi-million dollar contract, you know, I'm not gonna think about money as well. But for me, it was to form myself into the person that I wanted to become and have a view of the world that maybe was not so dependent on military history. And it was more open to different ideas and to especially how the United States operates. Because, you know, I grew up in a military environment, but that, I mean, the military is not necessarily how, you know, everybody else thinks. And so for me, as the first time out of a military installation in my 26 years, you know, 26 years that I always had to shoot coming in and out of the gate with, a, with an ID, I always had to stop when the flag is going up and down. Um, as the first time that I'm out and I'm in at Carnegie Mellon, then I'm, I'm, I have to sort of make an idea of, of who I am and the transition into civilian life. So that transition to civilian life is by far the hardest transition that anybody, I feel, I don't feel bad for you. I feel really bad for oh, you. No, it was hard. Yeah, because I did the same thing. Your identity is tied. Your identity is completely service. tied. Yeah. Your identity is completely tied. Not just my identity, but even it's not like I have a hometown to go to and become a farmer. Oh, or, no, you're or, absolutely right. I made that transition and I had to figure out the new identity. It's awful. It's terrible. Yeah, and so it for is. me, it was a, a great a great place to be able to, you know, not only find out about new opportunities that, that the world has to offer, but also just how people thought and what is the narrative and what is the philosophy that we have in America uh, as to you know, what, what success looks like in, in success, uh, at Carnegie Mellon was not so much into the, the job that you're going to have or how much money you're going to make, but is truly based on your ability to focus and come up with ideas that are beneficial for everybody else around you. So it was very tied into the military, but it was also, uh, you know, truly tied into the, to, to the community and the spirit that Pittsburgh has, you know, being a working blue collar town that, that, that really rolls up their sleeve and is, and, is, and is doing it for the town, for the village. So then you can have a couple of beers and watch the Steelers play. So Carnegie Mellon, for sure, in, extremely influential. Playing football was fun. Once I made the money, then it was just be a good professional and, 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 and have fun playing the games. And, you know, win a Super Bowl. You know, we were all trying to, to, to win games. And that was that's what became the biggest incentive is to try to do as good as you can so that you can be with each other as long as you can. Because once the season is over, the next year is a completely different team. And you truly value having, you know, that one season with that one player who came out of Penn State and was on the practice squad for that one year. And you know that he's not going to be on the team next year. But, I mean, those teams are special. You know, those – and I think everybody that plays in the NFL can tell you that those individual teams, even though sometimes they don't win a Super Bowl, sometimes those teams are so special. Obviously, the most special ones are the Super Bowl ones. But, you know, specific years of my life I had different teammates from all around the country and – I really enjoyed them, and so for me, the, the motivation after uh, getting paid, like they say in the NFL, was to to make sure that the, you know that we could that we could enjoy ourselves as much as we could during the year. Because football, it's a sport that you only play for six months. You know, the other six months you're just at home, you know, yeah. eating burgers. And it's year to year, right? Right, and it's year to year, exactly. Because you never know what's going to happen to season right. injury or you know somebody younger is coming along. Exactly. Right. And um, so you had to you you made that transition. You went from Pittsburgh, and then you did a year with the Ravens, mm -hmm. and then you transitioned out of the NFL. Want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I'm a, a, a great uh, example for for the transitions, both into out of the military and out of the NFL. Um, I, I think that for me, um, this has been a journey that started with me coming to the United States when I was 17 years old. I feel like that, that's been, that's been sort of like, like every other immigrant that has come from Europe, you know, maybe not so much in the, past, in the recent past, but a lot of them in, in the 1920s and whatnot, is just come to America to realize the American dream. You know, that's, that's all I had in mind, is just come to America, work hard, figure out what they got going on there, and try to make your way, and then hopefully your kids will be able to reap the benefits of your hard work and dedication, and then become successful. Unfortunately for me, you know, I was able to achieve that success that was supposed to be for my children, you know, and so, uh, now my focus is obviously my family, those that are around me, and then developing myself into areas that 
uh, I wish I would have done or anybody wishes they would have if they didn't have to work or they had the financial dependency. So um, I love reading. I love agriculture. I love fishing. I love doing things that for the military, obviously. Um, and I love, you know, being in the community. Uh, opportunities, you know, it's tough. It's tough because I think most people are usually motivated by fame, money, or that the fulfillment that you get out of a job. And in my case, I don't think I'm ever going to become more famous than I already am. And it's not something that I'm trying to pursue. I don't think I'm ever going to need more money. And then the fulfillment, I don't think I'm ever going to be as fulfilled as when I was a platoon leader in combat, standing in front of my men, you know, just, just trying to get after it. So it is a little bit of a tough position, but I cannot complain, you know, being in this tough position in Miami, Florida. Yeah. You know? There's, there's one more topic we want to cover. It's, it's you know, it's the, probably the, the, the biggest topic that your name was tied to. Um, and it's probably a little bit sensitive for some people, but it was the, you're, you're in soldier field, um, national anthems playing and you're out there, uh, honoring the flag and it caught national attention. Yeah. We'll talk a little bit about that. And it, yeah. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think that, you know, it was funny that I'm saying this and I'm on, on the, on the media, but the media obviously has a huge role in football. And I think that a lot of times, well, what you understand is that the media is going to utilize you. They don't care about my name. They don't care what I have to say. They don't care about the story. Is the media is going to write, you know, whatever story has to be written. And the media and the NFL both kind of conveniently work with each other to create spectacle and to create um, something that people are interested in. And, and there was a lot of issues regarding, you know, nationalism in the United States and, and, and what are the things that, that we can and cannot do. And and I was caught up in that that whole yeah. And it's kind of ironic that as a Spaniard, I get caught up in something that is so prevalent, you know, and, and so I would never thought in a million years that coming from Spain, which this happens all the time constantly, you know what I mean? I would come to the United States where I thought it would never be an issue uh, and, and be sort of put into the, you know, the spotlight or, or, or be used by, by the media as, as somebody uh, who's, who's, you know, on one side or the other of the debate. But, you know, in reality, I don't have any chance. I'm not champ. It's not like I went on a tour afterwards. It's not like I ever, I've never had social media. I never try to champion any ideas coming out of this. I consider myself an immigrant who's been given an incredible choice in this country. I can never be more thankful you know, for everything that's happened to me from the military to my ability to, to, to find success in the United States. And so for me, it's, it's, it's a very difficult, um, you know, quest, uh, the demand of, of, of not showing the utmost respect for something that I've, that I've fought for. Uh, but I completely understand that people have different opinions and people have different ways of showing it. Um, Unfortunately, with the Steelers, it was, it was a lot of confusion. You know, there's a lot of miscommunication. Uh, it was a sort of a botch plan, you know, that I had with, with, with the quarterback and the captains because uh, I wanted to respect everyone's opinions. Um, but, you know, if, if anything, um, sort of the stakeholders in this, in, this, in this situation were my teammates, my family, and all the people that I've ever served with. And so for me, you know, after the incident, you know, I try to make amends with, you know, every single one of those parties, you know, just try to take blame for anything if the blame falls on me then you know you who said cares? you're mea culpas right 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 yeah. you say like yeah you know what if anybody's upset i'm sorry you know what i mean i never try to offend anybody you know How, however you know it is it's just you know i just i just i don't have an agenda with any of this you know it's not like i'm trying to make a point out of anything i'm just you know trying to i'm, 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 I'm trying to make sure that you know i came to this country for freedom and i'm trying to exercise that freedom you know it, it, it will be very it'll be an existential crisis to me if if, if i had to renounce that freedom you know, after coming to the United States, because then I'm like, well, I'm not in Europe. You know what I mean? Why am I not in Europe? Not standing up for the anthem because nobody stands up for the anthem here. Nobody even knows the lyric. Nobody cares about that. You know what I mean? So, um, it matters to me. Is it's 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 always been something that has uh, given a lot of purpose. Since I was not able to find that purpose, maybe by winning Afghanistan and storming into Kabul, you know, with 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 the flag of victory, you know, uh, a lot of Vietnam soldiers, you know, suffering from this as well. And I was able to hear their stories when I was in Pittsburgh. Uh, for many years. And so uh, the United States, the army, the military, our nation, everybody, our freedom, our freedom of speech, our freedom of ideas, our ability to protest if, if we want to. I think all those things are incredibly valuable. Uh, and so, you know, for me, it, it wasn't a big deal. It's not like I, you know, I, it was a big deal because the media made it a big deal and I became sensitive to that. I became sensitive to the fact that I had a lot of scrutiny and my jersey was selling all the plays and people were utilizing my name and and they wanted me to change that, but but you know, for me, you know, it's, it's like, dude, you know, it's not, it's not like my teammates think any differently. It's not like we're, we're not disagreeing on anything, you know. So you didn't go on a USO tour or anything like that, right? 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 right. I, I didn't go on a, hey, you know, leave me alone. No, no. It's just, you know, for me, 
Uh, thankfully, I had Coach Tomlin, you know, who was – I thought he handled the press conference really, really well back then. Yeah, I, I, I don't watch. I don't watch press conferences. I, I, I don't think he personally cares too much. I mean, no, he didn't. That was the thing. He doesn't care about <laughs> it. He's the best. Yeah. He's, he's yeah, awesome. You know, he so did for, not. So for me, it's always been, um, you know, every single time I've had an issue with my career, and it was that wasn't the only time. You know, uh, you know, sometimes I've handled him well. Mostly never in public, mostly never in the media. They've always been internally, and a lot of players will have opinions as to how I handle them, you know, with with the locker room or not. But uh, maybe because I'm so tall, you know, I, I don't I don't have the the you know, or maybe because I've moved so much throughout my life, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to please everybody. You know, I already know that from from it's the get. Impossible, get-go. anyways. It's impossible. Yeah, it's, can't make everyone happy. Right. If you if you wrote a short bio of your life and you exposed it out there, out of a million people, three hundred thousand will hate your guts and will never want to speak to you and will wish you the worst things. So I already know those things already from showing up in a high school or showing up in a middle school when I'm brand new and people are making comments and you know I gotta I gotta be the new guy. Uh, unfortunately, when you're doing it on national television, it becomes a little more, more painful. But truly, if you just lay low and don't say anything else, you know, then things will go away. There, there's an interesting dynamic here, uh, and I've seen this in in other you know personnel, other friends and colleagues in soft, and in myself as well. There, there's a natural maturation process that happens as you're going from this young person and you're developing and putting, For sure. you're putting age and experience behind you, right? And you're developing into you know a, a better person, hopefully. Um, but you have this uh, initially maybe loyalty to self, right? And maybe to your family, right? But yeah. you want the good things for yourself. You want success. You want fame. You want money. And it's different for everyone. Right, right. And then you arrive on that team. Maybe it's the Rangers. Maybe it's it's soft team. Maybe it's uh, an ODA. You know, Maybe it's the Pittsburgh Steelers. And then you're like, okay, I want the team to be successful. And mm-hmm. you mentioned this as being a lineman. Maybe, maybe I have to sacrifice here for the good of the team. Right. Whatever that means. Yeah. Right? For so sure. I, don't, I don't get the sack or whatever, but but I, I held my own over here and that allowed us to get a first down, whatever it is. Right. Right. Then maybe you start to become more of a organizational leader and you're looking at, hey, what, what decisions can I make that are for the betterment of the unit, the, the organization writ large? And then maybe the nation. Right. What are our national enduring interests? Right. And as you grow and develop, those things start to like become weighted more heavily, right? For sure. I, ju- I just feel like, you know, maybe we're in a, such, a di- such a difficult time in history because maybe the access of information, the internet, you know, AI, you know, all, these, all these existential questions are happening right now. Uh, polarization in the United States, things that we've not seen, you know, things that are very familiar in Europe, but to see them in the United States is like, oh man, how do we handle this? Pittsburgh, during the elections, was a very hostile place. Um, for any discussion. And so being thrusted into this debate that was one of the corners of, or, or, or pillars of, 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 of this polarization debate was not, was not something where I can feel that I could speak for the nation or I could speak for my team and organization. I feel like unfortunately in those times you have to speak for yourself. Um, and I felt like that was sort of the, the lesson learned from the organization. If I could speak for the Pittsburgh Steelers is that you know, we're not all the same, you know, we're not, we're, we're, we're all have our different ideas and we strength have strength through diversity though. And, and, it's strength and we diversity. champion that as well. Exactly. Exactly. But you know, overall I have, you know, I, I don't think about moments like this. I, I only think about the good times, just like in the army, you know, I, I maybe I reflect on things and, and I try to come up with the best explanations, but you know, from my time in the army, I had an incredible time, even though I had challenges, even though I had was bitter at times, uh, overall I've matured, like you said, and and I've, I've put in perspective everything that I've been through. And then same with the Pittsburgh Steelers and, and these unfortunate incidents that uh, made my name be known, which is the worst thing that can happen to a ranger who's supposed to live always as a quiet professional, you know, and never tell anybody about their story. And so, you know, because of that, I'm automatically disqualified for any ranger sort of. Uh, awards that I could ever receive in the future. Well, I, th- I think we got to tell the stories that inspire the next generation of Rangers and other soft, right, and soldiers, uh, wherever they may be. I think that it is absolutely amazing to hear these stories, and I think people can learn from them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I just, you know, I, I prefer if it was from word of mouth, you know, not not from being on the on the front page of all the main media outlets. Uh, you know, that's. That's unfortunate, but you know, for me, at the end of the day, it's not like I depend on what everybody thinks of me. You know, 
living my life in the most individualistic town in America, in Miami, Florida. And so it's been a... Uh, and you, so you were, if I'm not mistaken, you called the Super Bowl for ESPN to play. Yeah, this. yeah, yeah. So that, yeah, so... Um, that must have been fun, huh? Yeah, so I've always heard about LA. I've always heard about California, you know, and this journey that I've had uh, in the United States because of the Marines, because of Rhoda. There's such a connection between San Diego and, and, and Rhoda Naval Station. So I've always heard about California, California... You know, watch the show Matt Man. You see Don Draper <laughs> and go to California and find himself. And so, there's always been such mystique surrounding California to me. And when they offered me this job to go to Hollywood and not Hollywood, but to go in, you know to LA into that area and, and, and see the media side, um, I found it very interesting because you know the guys that I would be calling the games with were you know a Mexican, a Cuban, and myself, who we, we all three speak very very different Spanish, and to be you know, talking about American football would be like, you know, someone from Boston and someone from Alabama talking about bullfighting. You know, it was, it was such a cultural, you know, sort of, I just thought, you know, it's, it's hilarious, you know, like, of course I want to go out there and, you know, speak like I'm uh, talking about a soccer game but about football. And just to see the, the, the side of, of, of the media uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the football um, industry, because I know it very well. I know how referees work and I know how oh, yeah. all these little intricacies about the game and I wanted to see just how a production meeting you know happens in the media you know like how, who decides and how and why do we talk about these certain issues on, on a sports show do they really care and mean what they're saying when they're debating or is it all for entertainment how these personalities get created and um I thought that was really interesting, you know, to see it. Not that I would ever want to do that. I would never do it again. You know, I would never want to dedicate myself to that world. But but just to see it and just to experience it and just to see how one part of the country is dying to be on television and have to do with the whole movie industry and, and the whole city revolves around that and, um, you know, how the sports uh, industry basically is evaluated, you know, on how you present the content. I think that was something that as a player I definitely missed. Uh, I never realized, and, and, and now it's, you know, obviously now I've had that experience, it gives me that much more understanding of how football works, you know, how, what California's about, you know, even if it's just small taste. Uh, and in the meantime, I got to spend, you know, time in New York, you know, California, Phoenix, and Miami. I mean, just having the chance to be in the three corners of the United States, you know, in 2023 was just an amazing experience. Yeah, that's awesome. So you're enjoying Miami and lo loving life. Oh, yeah, yeah. Family's life. doing well. Can't complain, for sure. Yeah. Hey, um, do you have any more questions you want to ask us? Uh, no, just uh, in closing, uh, I just want to ask if there's any things that you might want to, you know, any thoughts you might want to leave our listeners with, especially somebody that's out there serving on a soft team right now or, or in a supporting role to, to soft. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think that one of the things that has been a constant theme in my life has been learning and being extremely observant and learning not just how to take care of yourself, but how to continuously adapt to the, the new thoughts that come into your life. And some of those thoughts sometimes are very negative. You know, sometimes you go through life and you go through these, you know, challenging periods of time. You don't know if it's the hormones, you don't know if it's the life circumstances, you're aging, I don't know what it is, but sometimes you go, you get presented with these challenges, your body changes too, you know, your body doesn't feel as good as it used to. Um, and I feel like there's a, a constant need to self evaluate yourself and to grow as a person in order to meet these challenges. But you cannot do that from a passive standpoint. You have to do it from a very active standpoint. So just like you have to take care of your body and learn how to take care of your body if you want to have a long career in the service, in the military or whatnot, I feel like you have to do that as well mentally and, and, and constantly ask yourself, what is it that I think about, you know, and, and in terms of my, my own philosophy, but how can I make it better? You know, am I, am I missing something out? Uh, that I that I don't know about, you know. Maybe you pick up a, a book about something that is completely opposite uh, to what you think. You know, you pick up, you know, a, 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 or some some way of, of of maintaining yourself as grounded as possible and and always on the always on the rise when it comes to learning. You know, as you get wiser, I think that, that you become better prepared to, to to handle you know future incidents and you're able to rationalize things as opposed to just you know dropping down and saying you know somebody needs to do this for me, especially since the military institutionalizes you uh, to do everything in according to SOP. And sometimes in life doesn't really have an SOP. You just have to go out there and find it yourself. So I always encourage uh, self-development, not necessarily 
Um, you know, th- these podcasts are in, uh, extremely great for entertainment and information, but I think the process of finding out what works best for your body and what works best for you is, is an individual journey that you have to embark on yourself and you have to spend time on it. You know, it's not something that somebody's going to tell you the secret sauce as to how you're going to handle any success or any situation you find yourself in. Something I had to learn was what you're talking about now, which is putting that emphasis on self-care too. I, of course, if you're a leader, you're concerned about your people first, right? right? And then you always take second. But at some point, in order to be able to take care of your people to the best of your ability, you have to be able to tell, take care of yourself. You have to be in a good state of mind, good physical health, right? And I didn't learn those things until I was already long in the tooth, so to speak, right? Right, right. So if I can do anything, it's to inculcate that next generation, those young operators and professionals and support guys that are coming in and they're at the E5, E6 level and I'm trying to teach them, you know, hey, take, take care of yourself, right? Um, understand what good mental health looks like, right? With spiritual, cognitive, right? Physical, all these things so that um, when the time comes, you know, you can give all of yourself to whatever the situation is, right? right? Whether it's taking care of your family or taking care of your unit, right? You got to take care of yourself first, right? Not in a selfish way. Right. Yeah, no, for sure. I just feel like along this journey that I've had, it's been so many times where I've been having a conversation with somebody that just doesn't, that just can't make it. You know what I mean? And he, and he can't make it because his mind is not allocated and dedicated to the task. And when you're talking about special operations community, when you talk about the NFL, they're just tasks that require all your attention at all times for very long periods of time. You cannot, you cannot come off, you cannot let go of the gas. You know, when you when you let go of the gas, things will start escaping your control. You don't feel as prepared. You lose the confidence. And so you always have to be ready to, to, to deal with anything that life uh, throws at you. And, and I'm not saying that I'm an expert by any means, but I'm saying that I dedicate a, a large portion of my, my, my time uh, to always better myself in, 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 in some sort of way. And a lot of them uh, are about being able to answer these questions that I wasn't able to answer when I was in Afghanistan, right? Like, you know, while we here, this and that. So always being able to, to pick a book, you know, in my case, has been an extremely helpful, um, you know, way that, that I think that people sometimes are we looking in, in today's society because our attention span gets, gets a lot shorter and gets a lot closer. And, you know, classic books regarding things that interest you, I think they're always amazing, amazing uh, tools for your, for your mental health and for your, for your life in period. Well, AV, because of your military service and with the Ranger Regiment and then obviously your, you know, career in the NFL, regardless as if you never wanted fame, right? You have it to a degree, you have a large sphere of influence. And, and I just wanna say thank you for being a positive role model, right? You've used that platform that you've been given um, to, to set an example, to show you know, what right looks like. Um, and it's so important for uh, young people to just have good mentors to look up to, even if they don't have a personal relationship with you and they see how you carry yourself, how you conduct yourself, the things that you value that are important to you. Uh, and I think there's there's life lessons to be learned there. So I appreciate wow, that. Well, thank you so much, especially coming from you. Yeah, in fact, on behalf of all of SoftCast, we want to thank you. It's been, listening to your story, it's been an amazing journey from call to service to West Point to uh, serving in our military, um, 10th Mountain Rangers, and then the NFL. Amazing stories into the NFL. And then to where you are today, um, amazing journey. I know when General Fenton talks about comparative and competitive advantage, he's talking about people like you. And it, it, it's it's interesting to kind of live through that story and, and see that in you. Um, on, and, and on behalf of General Fenton, we want to thank you um, very much for coming on to the podcast. Oh, well, thank you so much. But again, I've been I've been extremely thankful to be, you know, sort of brought along by amazing leaders and amazing mentors uh, throughout my entire life. So uh, if I'm ever, you know, a good example in anything is something that I picked up from someone else, you know, and I, and I attempt to display. But uh, yeah, I always think that, you know, as a ranger, you always thought to be a quiet professional. And, you know, it's, it's tough for me sometimes to carry this responsibility of People saying that I'm a role model in any ways. You know, I, I just try to do, you know, what I've been taught by my parents, taught by, by, by the military, learn from the Navy, learn from the Air Force, learn from the Marines. Uh, it's been an incredible journey. And every, just like we said earlier, I cannot say no to the military. Hey, what a great way to kick off our season with episode number one with Alejandro Villanueva. I want to personally thank him for driving up here three hours to be here in person when he could have done Zoom or something else. He's just so humble the way he told his stories was absolutely amazing, and I uh, wish we could have got deeper into the combat story a little bit, but man, there was so much packed into this episode, wasn't there, Chance? 
Yeah, it was absolutely amazing and, and an honor for us to have AV in the studio. He's just a humble guy, like you said, approachable, just a stand-up individual. Um, and I really enjoyed you know, having the opportunity to interview him. Hey, if you enjoyed the show today and you want to make sure you don't miss out on any of the amazing content we have coming up for you, make sure you subscribe. You can drop us a line at softcast at socom.mil. We're on all the podcast platforms, and we're also on YouTube. Hey, on behalf of General Fenton, CSM Shorter, I want to thank Alejandro Villanueva for being here. And I also want to thank you for listening. Really appreciate it, and we'll look forward to seeing you in the next episode.